Hello and good evening. Thank you all for being here for this inspirational evening about our future with human compatible AI. We will be touching on challenges, of course, but we'll focus on opportunities for creating an optimistic version of our future. After all, we are storytellers. We have the power and duty to envision utopia and lead the way in the spirit of Oscar Wilde, to whom, according to some research I read recently, living in the moment was not as significant as envisioning utopia. Thank you to the WGA, the Writers' Education Committee and the Genre Committee for hosting this event. And a special thanks to Greg Mitchell who helped me pull this together. We were starting off with uh, three mini TED Talk-like presentations from our panelists. And after that, move on to questions, a couple from me and then the audience. Now I'm excited to welcome our estimated panelists, all of them experts at the intersection of tech and the humanities in the order of how the presentations will go. Dr. Safia Noble is an associate professor at UCLA in the Department of Information Studies. She also holds appointments in African American Studies and Gender Studies. Dr. Noble is the author of a best selling book on racist and sexist algorithmic bias in commercial search engines entitled Algorithms of Oppression How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. Her academic research focuses on the design of digital media platforms on the internet and their impact on society. Her work is both sociological and interdisciplinary, making the ways that digital media impacts and intersects with issues of race, gender, culture, and technology. technology. Sophia, thanks so much for coming. Our second panelist will be Katya Klinova. She's the head of AI labor and the economy at the Partnership on AI, PAI, an organization that conducts research, organizes discussions, shares insights, provides thought leadership, responds to questions from the public and media, and creates educational material that advances, advan, advances, oh God, I'm sorry, advances the understanding of AI technologies. I had a bad night, didn't get much sleep. But luckily there's few uh, things left for me at PI, PAI, Katya focuses on studying the mechanisms for steering AI progress towards greater equality of opportunity and improving the working conditions along the AI supply chain. In this role, she oversees multiple programs, including the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. Prior to a PAI, Katya worked for the United Nations and at Google. Thank you, Katya, for being here. And last but not least, uh, Stuart Russell, who is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and the director of the Center for Human Compatible AI at UC Berkeley. His book, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach, is a standard text in AI. It is used in more than 1,300 uh, 1, universities in 118 countries. Boo, wow, that's a lot. Professor Russell's research covers a wide range of topics in artificial intelligence, including philosophical foundations. He also works for the United Nations, developing a new global seismic monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. His current concerns include the treat of autonomous weapons and the long-term future of artificial, artificial intelligence and its relation to humanity. Thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. And here we go. And we'll start off with um, Sophia Noble. Thank you so much. 
um, Alexa, for the introduction. It's such an honor and a pleasure to get to be on this panel with Katya and um, Stuart just to talk about our work. And um, I would like to kind of kick it off by sharing a little bit about the work that I do at UCLA and how I came to thinking about the impact of AI and algorithms on society. I um, currently uh, co-founded and co-direct a research center at UCLA called the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. And it really is a space and a place for us to study not so much um, in centering kind of AI and technology as much as looking at the effects of these various types of technologies in our society and in particular on vulnerable people and communities around the world uh, who uh, may never understand anything about how these technologies work, but most certainly will be affected by them. And, you know, I came to this work after a 15 year career in marketing and advertising. So I really can appreciate the audience tonight and the kind of work that you do, because in my career, I've also, as much as I've been um, a marketer in a past life and a researcher now, um, uh, in, in both kind of occupations, I've been a storyteller and really had to engage in the process of making legible um, ideas and um, I love this kind of provocation of thinking about the world that we want to live in. And certainly, I think many researchers are very interested in um, the world that we live in and also the kind of phenomena that are with us that will change the world to come and the worlds that we inherit and the worlds that we pass on. So um, I uh, let me just start by sharing a little bit about my kind of core research area. I wrote a book. Um, I happen to have it here because I didn't bring any slides and I know that my colleagues here did. Um, but I, you know, I wrote this book here called Algorithms of Oppression. I think from the cover, you can see a little bit here um, that this is a sample search result. And so you can imagine this is a book about Google. Um, uh, but also other companies. And what I was thinking about when I wrote this book is I was thinking about the way in which um, scholars and various publics and communities would access knowledge in the future. Um, I was going to graduate school, getting a PhD in library and information science at the University of Illinois. And um, I was doing that at a time when Google was emerging as kind of a, a new player um, in search I and mean, it had been with us for a few years, but it, we, it, this was kind of right about the time that this new cottage search engine optimization industry was developing. And I was watching how the public was shifting its relationship to knowledge and information and expertise from books, from libraries, from subject matter experts to search engines, um, namely Google. I mean, we started to develop these kind of mantras in schools by among parents and teachers to just Google it if you wanna know anything. And um, of course, as a person who was thinking about large scale systems and the future of knowledge and how will people know what they need to know a hundred years from now, um, I was uh, surprised at the way in which so many people in the public and also other kinds of experts, politicians, teachers, parents um, were um, thinking of these large scale advertising platforms as kind of new public libraries. Um, and of course, because I was in graduate school with people who were not only in the field of librarianship, but also in computer science and also in children's literature and children's librarianship, um, I, was, I was deeply concerned about what it might mean. Now, part of this is because I'd spent my whole first 15 years um, at work working in marketing and advertising. And like you, I really understood um, the way in which narratives could be crafted to influence people um, around products and services in that case. Um, so 
one of the things that I think is like so crucial that I learned in my research and writing this book was that one, people engage with all kinds of different uh, algorithmically driven systems, or they're engaging with what we call kind of narrow AI. And I'll leave it to Professor Russell to talk, you know, more specifically about um, the many types of AI um, that we're engaging with. And of course, what people often think they're dealing with is some type of superior intellectual project um, or technology that is more expert than they are, that, that can make better decisions than human beings. And of course, one of my larger concerns has been the way in which um, we have kind of, as a society, turned over so many really important decisions to, um, you know, predictive modeling, uh, uh, coarsely constructed types of AI, um, large scale advertising kind of um, profit imperative driven systems to understand ourselves. Um, on the cover of my book, one of the searches that I conducted as I was writing this book is here. And it's, um, it's, it, this was shortly after Google introduced um, auto suggestion. So you could type in something and the technology would fill it in for you, um, anticipating what you might be looking for, right? So I typed in, why are black women so, and I got so angry, so loud, so mean, so attractive, so lazy, so annoying, so confident, so sassy, so insecure. Now, at the time that I wrote this, my daughter was about 13 years old. And I thought to myself, um, as I was looking for black women and girls and Latinas and Asians, um, girls and, and women on the, on the internet through search engines, over and over, I was met with pornography and a kind of hyper-sexualized, um, sexual objectifying, um, uh, websites those were those dominated the first page of search and that of course was the thread that i pulled on to unfold a book that would help us think about not only how is it that um, certain industries in this case for many years up until fairly recently the pornography industry really had a lock they had the most money and the most technical skill to optimize around minoritized populations but what does it mean when um, these systems can be gamed either by the, the, those who are willing to pay the most or those who have an incredible amount of technical skill? And why, why um, are we so reliant upon these kinds of systems? What are the social forces and the political forces that push us more and more toward these kinds of systems? Again, this is AI um, in, in maybe one of the most banal um, applications. I mean, certainly um, when people think of AI, they think of Hal, they think of Watson, you know, they think of um, even the Terminator, right? These are the kinds of Hollywood, um, you know, inventions or narratives about AI. But so much of the AI that we're dealing with and that we're working with in the public is, um, it's banal, it's simple, it's recommending systems, it's, um, it's determining whether you get a mortgage or whether you don't, whether you are classified into the right profile that should be admitted to a school or a university, whether you've got the right words on your resume that a software screener can pick up and recognize and recommend you into a job opportunity or not. These are the kinds of things that I study. And um, as I close here and turn it over to my colleagues, I'll just say that, um, for many of us, we spend a lifetime working on the, the minutia of these issues. And we are, like you, very invested in helping the public understand the import of our work. Um, I really invite tonight a conversation about how those partnerships between um, deep subject matter experts like us and our colleagues um, around the world can be partners with writers in um, telling stories and informing the public. You know, we have great relationships, many of us, with journalists who do a, a tremendous amount of work in disseminating research findings. But there are other ways to help um, publics understand um, the import of 
the kinds of worlds that are being made and the spaces of resistance too that we could imagine around um, some of the new inventions that uh, in this kind of realm of AI. So I'd like to invite our conversation to you about how those partnerships and how our kind of your expertise and our expertise can meet in some type of um, respected middle place. Um, one of the challenges I can tell you as a black woman scholar, um, and I know so many um, people who have these similar experiences are that we um, often are kind of asked for, to pick our brains about something that we've, you know, spent, five years writing a book about, right? That just can't be downloaded in 45 minutes in a way that does it justice. Um, and so we're interested, I think, in um, you know, being uh, true partners in the storytelling processes with you and ensuring that those stories are right. Um, so I, with that, I think I'll leave it there and just say thank you so much for this invitation. I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. And let's move on to uh, Katia. Thank you so much, Alexa. Thanks to everyone in the audience. What an exciting audience to be addressing. And of course, I'm just absolutely honored to be uh, here with Sophia and Stuart. It's very hard to uh, you know, take on from Sophia. And you know, for those of you who haven't read her book, it's just absolutely terrific. And I spent almost a decade working for Google. So I don't tend to read books about Google, like normally read books to learn something new. But this was the book I read was Goosebumps. And uh, you know, it made me think in new ways about something I thought I knew really well and thought a lot about. So highly recommend those that book. With that, let me share my screen. And um, Alexa, if, if you, in case you, you're not seeing my screen, please let me know. Uh, so as Alexa said, my name is Katia. I work for the Partnership on AI, where um, I think about the economic impacts of AI and the kind of economic future that this, it is bringing about and how to steer it uh, towards inclusive economic outcomes for workers that are very commonly expected to be left behind. So let me start by showing you um, really a very happy graph. This is um, US GDP per capita over the last 60 years, and you can see steady growth. It, in fact, it has tripled uh, since the 60s. But then when we look at wages in the same period of time, they kept growing up until uh, almost the 80s, and then something happened. And we started seeing this fork that is becoming larger and larger. So if you are um, someone with an advanced degree, especially an advanced degree in STEM, you've probably done very well in the labor market and your wages uh, grown quite a bit. But then for um, quite a few skill groups of workers, their wages stagnated or even declined. And it is a very, very non-normal situation in the economy that in 2020, some people are making what they were making in the 60s. Um, so what is, what is the, it, it's, the situation is a little bit better for women, but really not that much. So what really happened there? And really it's a lot of things that overlay, you know, it's a decline of, um, of the labor movement. It's the rise of neoliberal economic policy. Um, it's of course uh, the rise of globalization, but you can intuitively know that that's not all of it. You know, if you are trying to bring jobs back from abroad to the US, you cannot bring them back because a lot of them have been automated. And really uh, more and more economists are pinpointing the role of technology in, in the kind of, in the rise of inequality that we saw uh, in the last three decades. And this is a graph from a paper by Simogu and Restrepo, which illustrates how much automation really accelerated. And like automation is not something that, you know, is just like came here recently because of AI. Automation is quite an old phenomenon, but it used to be accompanied in equal proportion or it was equal pace by creation of new tasks for humans that created labor demand and new jobs in the economy. But since 
is about mid 80s, the creation of new tasks for um, for human workers really is slowed down a lot. And now automation um, acts, uh, just outpaces the creation of new tasks by a lot and they do not match anymore. And this is how you start seeing the elimination of uh, jobs, especially middle paying jobs in the economy, jobs that pay wages for people without college degrees um, and without, uh, sometimes without uh, high school degrees as well. So AI is a continuation of this trend because it actually dramatically expands what is possible to automate. If before, uh, mostly what, was able, what we were able to automate is like well-structured um, sequential tasks, then now even things like driving, as unstructured as driving can be automated. Um, what does this, um, what, where does this lead us and how do we think about the reasons for that, uh, you know, focus uh, on, on excessive automation? Where did it come from? And most of my, you know, most of my work time, I really uh, uh, spent thinking about the first two reasons on this slide, the, the distorted economic incentive and the shift in bargaining power away from workers. Um, and, you know, I can talk at length about those, but you know, in today's talk, I actually wanted to talk about this third one, which you know, there isn't nearly as much um, research on. It's not nearly as well described, and I think this particular audience can have a lot, uh, you know, very good intuitions about the third one: the dominant visions and imaginaries. What is what is imaginary? Let me use the definition from Professor Jasanov. Um, these are collectively held and performed, so acted upon visions of desirable future, animated by shared understandings of social order that can be attained through the advances in science and technology. And so economists understand that this is important, the norms and the visions that inspire researchers are very important, but it is really hard for us to um, to describe and explain that and quantify that, let alone uh, come up with interventions for that. This is why I really wanted to bring up this topic with you all today. So what is this, uh, what is the performed imaginary around AI? What is the vision? Um, it is the, the, the field's goal de facto is building a human level or superhuman AI. And you can see it demonstrated through very different um, channels. You can browse um, you know, mission statements of leading AI labs who talk about beating and exceeding human performance. A lot of the benchmarks uh, that lead scientists really chase and get celebrated for beating their around matching human performance on tasks like um, you know, image recognition or speech recognition, uh, translate, uh, transcription of text, um, the, the, the best leading brains you know, we have on this planet are working on building machines that would do that better than humans. And so then how can we be surprised that we get a lot of automating AI? So kind of like summing this up, where, what are the building blocks of this vision? And, you know, I'm putting a question mark here and I really mean it. Uh, and I would love to invite your um, ideas through the chat and Q&A and please reach out to me after as well, because you might be able to add a lot more to this. So aside from the, uh, the focus of the field leaders, the leading labs, companies, and researchers, and as well as the past dependence, kind of like the research that already exists that they're building on, and the benchmarks that already exist that they're uh, using to measure progress in the field. There is also this uh, sort of fluffier, you know, but potentially very, very influential third bucket. It's ideas about what is the desirable uh, social order that AI should be enabling. And some of it comes from things, you know, that I'm putting in quotation marks, the California ideology that is often described as, um, you know, this marriage between 
um, Silicon Valley um, entrepreneurial zeal and uh, the um, the the heritage that exists around um, around Silicon Valley, right? And and they can can often be summarized as um, sort of a call to not regulate the industry but redistribute its profits. And redistribution is just seen as a little bit of a solution to a lot of the inequality problems that are getting created. But I think it is, um, you know, can be instructive to just walk down the streets of San Francisco and see how difficult it is to be solving inequality with just redistribution. And then, of course, and this is, um, you know, where um, I would love to invite your discussion is this uh, science fiction utopias that have captured the imagination a lot of, of a lot of the AI entrepreneurs. And, and especially here, the Asimov's robot novels and the Star Trek were some of the first utopias that portrayed technology and automation uh, in a very positive light and came really from a good place of imagining an egalitarian society where everyone gets to share in on the benefits of technological progress. And so now it is not uncommon for startups that pitch, pitch funding to build a Star Trek technology to raise funding or for tech executives to be leading their teams with vision directly borrowed from uh, Star Trek and to be saying that I grew up watching Star Trek and this is what I wanna build. Uh, but really the real miracle of Star Trek and this is what uh, Manu Sadia who wrote the book Trekonomics also spoke about in that book was not in that technology but in the social order that enables everyone to be benefiting from that technological progress. And this is the social order we do not have right now. So we are uh, investing billions of dollars every year to be building the kind of technology that uh, you know, was seen as in, in science fiction books while not having the, the social order that would enable a society, everyone in society to benefit from that. And so, um, if, if we keep doing that, can we really be expecting a different result from what we've been seeing from previous um, waves of technological development, and namely in the last 30 to 40 years? We really need to be thinking about how the social order needs to change in order uh, for the AI progress and the future of AI to be beneficial and prosperous for everyone. So we're thinking about how um, companies can take uh, commitments around, uh, uh, around prosperous future for workers uh, through the work of the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative. If you wanna follow this, uh, this work, here's the website, or you can find me on Twitter. Also, please feel free to reach out and email me. Thank you very much. Let me hand it over back to Alexa now. So thank you so much, Katya. That was, oops. Thank you so much. I loved it. Very interesting. Next panelist. I'm welcoming Stuart Russell to the podium. Thank you very much. Um, so let's see, I guess, since I'm an academic like Sophia, I have to, to show you my latest book, uh, which is Human Compatible. And that actually has um, uh, more detailed explanations of a lot of the ideas I'm gonna talk about. Um, so let me begin by just saying um, what AI is, because I think uh, in the media, there's an awful lot of confusion uh, it's mixed up with machine learning or deep learning um, and various other things that I'll get to. But the way we think about AI within the field is basically that we are building machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. So I'll just give you a little concrete example, right? So here's a machine that we might build. This is the Waymo self-driving car. And uh, it gets in 
perception, information percepts from cameras, uh, and it does actions. In other words, it, it, in this case, it turns its steering wheel or accelerates or brakes. Um, and then that affects the environment and what it perceives next. But it doesn't actually do anything at all uh, until a human gives it some objective, like take me to the airport. Um, now, there are other objectives built in. The, the human passenger, passenger doesn't say, oh, and please don't run over pedestrians. Um, that's built in by the manufacturers. Um, and we'll see that even building in those kinds of objectives is, is a very tricky process. So this is basically how we think about AI. And you can replace that self-driving car by a chess program, um, by a recommender system that operates inside a search engine or a social media platform. Uh, it's exactly the same idea in all of these cases. Uh, and we just have to figure out Okay, how to put the code into that box so that the right stuff happens when the percepts come in and the action goes out. Um, and this is the only thing that matters about an AI system is what does it do given the objectives and percepts that it receives? Um, and I think it's important to note that that's not often how it's described uh, in the media. Um, a lot of the time when you look at newspapers, for example, you would think that everyone in AI is working towards the next big flashy demo, right? So DeepMind beats Kasparov or Watson wins Jeopardy or AlphaGo beats Lisa Doll. Um, these are not breakthroughs at all, right? In fact, the breakthroughs that enabled these things to happen actually occurred decades earlier, right? On someone's whiteboard, in someone's conversation with uh, with one of their students, whatever it might be. Um, and these are you know, impressive feats of engineering that took those ideas, that took many ideas from, from several decades of research and put them together to make a demonstration. But the real breakthroughs are the things that happen uh, in people's minds and whiteboards and offices. Another thing AI is not um, is spooky immersion consciousness, right? Nobody in AI is working on making machines conscious. Nobody in AI has any idea how we would do that. If you gave me a trillion dollars to do it, I would just give it back because I have the faintest idea how I would spend any of that money to make a conscious machine and nor does anybody else. Um, and it also, right, so a lot of movies depend on this idea that, um, that somehow, you know, some spark happens uh, and then you have consciousness. And once you have consciousness, all bets are off. Right, and, and all kinds of stuff happens. Um, but this, of course, is really not true, right? Because what causes the machine to behave in a certain way? Well, it's the C code or the Python code or whatever it is, the, the program that is running. And that program is continuing to run whether or not that machine uh, is conscious. And so the consequences come from the code that's running, not from the fact that the machine may or may not be conscious. That actually has no causal uh, impact at all. Um, and also, you know, we face another problem. You know, even if we did accidentally make a conscious machine, we would have no way of knowing that we had done so, right? Because all we can do is observe the behavior and we can, you know, we can observe the C++ code running inside. We have much more access to a computer than we do to the human brain, but we wouldn't know what to look for in the running of the C++ code, right? What, which C++ instructions, when they run, are generating conscious experience? It doesn't, it, the question almost seems senseless. So, so this direction, I think, is, is really a dead end for thinking uh, about the, the future evolution of AI Skill and, and its social impact. AI. But there are much it's more important, more urgent things that are happening. So it's here's a little movie that we made. react 100 times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors. And just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shape explosive. This is how it works.
So um, we showed this movie at the United Nations at the negotiations um, on a treaty to ban fully autonomous weapons. Uh, and that was November, 2017. Um, Russian ambassador scoffed at the movie and said, oh, this is science fiction. We, we should not be discussing these kinds of weapons because they won't exist for 25 or 30 years. And I really embarrassed that you would bring this to such an important body. Um, at the time he spoke, Train. this weapon was already being built in prototype and it was announced a month later. Uh, and this is a news article from this week, uh, NPR, um, that, that these weapons have now with very high probability been killing people in Libya. Uh, they have so fully autonomous weapons that find their own targets uh, and blow them up. Um, so, um, so these are things that really matter to the world. Uh, and I think they're under emphasized, under discussed. And I would say the Terminator franchise, you know, you might think that would be a warning to people about developing military robotics and, and fully autonomous weapons. But everyone sees that as just science fiction because it involves spooky emergent consciousness. And until the spooky emergent consciousness happens, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, whereas in fact, the opposite is true. Uh, there's a lot to worry about uh, and there isn't gonna be any spooky emergent consciousness. Uh, so I'll spend the last part of my, my few minutes talking about something that Alan Turing said. So this is Alan Turing, he's the founder of computer science um, and uh, in many ways, the founder of artificial intelligence as well. Uh, in 1951, he said this, it seems probable that once the machine, I'll do the accent, that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So um, he offers no apology, no mitigation, no way out, uh, just complete resignation. Um, and as Katja was pointing out in her talk, um, this is kind of the, the story right, the socio-technical imaginary uh, of AI. And we have been ignoring what Turing said, right? We have just continued as if he had never said it. We have been developing and developing and developing and pushing and pushing and pushing capabilities um, towards the future that he's predicting. Uh, and it's kind of sort of bizarre, right? It's as if we were busy developing the capability to airlift the entire human population to Mars. But no one was asking, well, what are we gonna eat and breathe when we get there, right? It's in some ways a sort of a completely insane uh, period in human history um, and it's continuing. So why does he say that uh, we're gonna lose control? And it actually comes back to what I said at the beginning about what is AI, machines whose actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. And the way we lose control is that we specify the objectives incorrectly. And um, this is not a new story, right? I mean, the, it, you're all familiar with the story of King Midas, right? He specifies the objective, everything I touch should turn to gold. Uh, and then of course his food and drink and his family turn to gold and he dies in misery and starvation, right? And, and almost every culture that I've looked into this, uh, many cultures around the world have the same story uh, in a different guise, but the same basic, uh, the same basic point. Uh, you can see it in the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, you can see it in the genie, right? If you ever uh, get three wishes from a genie, your third wish is gonna be, please undo the first two wishes because I've ruined the world. Right, so we know this and we've known it for thousands of years. Um, and once again, right, what matters here is how well the machine carries out your wishes, right? How hard is it to interfere with the machine? These are matters of competence and not consciousness, right? The consciousness doesn't have a, a causal role in this story. Um, and we're seeing really serious consequences and Sophia talked about some of them. 
uh, with search engines, with, uh, with social media. Uh, and one way to interpret why things are going wrong, in fact, is you could sort of blame the algorithms, but you could blame the people who define the objectives for the algorithm. And in social media, they define the objective to be maximizing click-through, right? The probability that you will click on the next thing, the YouTube video, uh, the news article or whatever. Um, and I think I, I, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that what they were expecting was that the algorithms would learn what people want, right? And, and stop sending them completely irrelevant garbage that they're not interested in. Um, but that in fact is not what the algorithms do because that's not the best way to maximize click-through. The best way to maximize click-through is to modify people to be more predictable, right? And the algorithms learn actually to send people a propaganda curriculum, if you like, a sequence of content that will move them from where they are now to a place where they are easier to predict in their consumption. Um, and that tends to be, I think, at least anecdotally, uh, a place where people are more extreme. They're either, you know, eco-terrorists or, or QAnon believers or whatever it might be. And these algorithms have more power over the cognitive input of human beings than any dictator in history. They control what literally billions of people spend hours every day reading and watching and listening to, right? And so, um, and they have been deployed on the earth uh, with no oversight whatsoever, no outside control. Um, and, and they're written by, you know, I could tell you people who graduate, you know, are undergraduates from Berkeley who are very good at drinking coffee and very good at writing code, but not so good at understanding the social impact of what they're doing. Um, and when you're pursuing the wrong objective, the better the AI system, the worse the outcome is going to be, right? And there are lots of movies uh, that take this, uh, this theme. I think maybe one of the best ones actually is, is one of the earliest, uh, which is Colossus, the Forbin project from uh, 1970s, where uh, the Russian and the US defense computers uh, are given an incorrect objective, which is to, uh, to enforce peace uh, and they do it by actually taking over the nuclear arsenals of both countries and threatening the human race with those arsenals. Um, so again, um, and I think 2001 is another good example, the conflict between the humans, in particular Dave and Hal, comes about because Hal has been given an objective that isn't aligned with the objectives of the humans on board the spaceship. Uh, and so they inevitably get into a conflict. Um, and, uh, you know, interestingly, um, eventually Dave outwits Hal uh, and manages to switch Hal off, even though most of the crew has already been killed at that point. Um, and I've been asked to consult on some movies about superintelligence and the, the conversation always seems to go the same way. So the writer or the director says, okay, well, you know, we're gonna have this movie and, and someone creates a superintelligence. Uh, and we want you to explain to us how did the humans outwit the superintelligence? Right, well, that's just a contradiction in terms, right? If it really is a superintelligence, then you don't outwit it. Uh, you lose. It's like it's like saying, well, you know, how you know how do you choose Go moves so that you beat AlphaGo uh, at the game of Go, right? Well, you just can't because it's just better than you are. Uh, it's better than any human being by a mile. Um, so there is, I think, a solution, and this is what I'm working on now for the last five years or so, is, is actually a completely different way of conceiving of, uh, of what AI should be. Uh, and in particular, so there are three principles sort of in, in homage to uh, Isaac Asimov, um, but the key one here is number two, that the robot is uncertain about human preferences. It knows that it doesn't know what the objective is. Um, and this is a now a completely different kind of AI system. And we can, we can actually, you know, I'm not going to get into the details of the, the mathematical framework, but the point is that when you build AI systems this way, and when they actually solve this, this problem, right, which is to be of benefit to humans when you don't know what 
of benefit means, you behave in a completely different way. The machine, rather than pursuing an objective that it believes to be correct in a single-minded way, instead, it's going to defer to human beings. It's going to ask permission, right? So before it fixes, you know, our carbon dioxide problem by turning our oceans into sulfuric acid, it's going to ask permission because it doesn't know what we what we think about the oceans. So it's going to say, "Is it okay if I turn the oceans into sulfuric acid?" And we'll say, "Actually, no. We don't want you to do that." Um, and now it's learned something more about human preferences, and then we'll have to come up with a different plan. And in the extreme, this type of machine will allow itself to be switched off because it wants to avoid doing whatever it is that we are trying to prevent by switching it off. Because if we're trying to prevent it, it's something we don't like and therefore it doesn't want to do it. Okay, So you get a completely different kind of behavior out of this uh, new type of machine. But this means that we have to rebuild the whole field of AI. The last 70 years of research has been based on the standard model. Uh, we have to rebuild everything before it's too late. Um, and if we do this, we get this other outcome, right? The, the, it works the other way. The better the AI system, the better the outcome is gonna be for human beings. And the upside is really pretty enormous. Um, and if you're wondering why a country's investing billions and billions and billions of dollars in this AI thing, right? It's because when you have general purpose AI, it's essentially an unlimited source of wealth, right? Everything that's expensive right now, like training a surgeon or building a school or connecting your village to the city with a road, um, those are really expensive because they involve lots and lots of expensive, highly trained human beings and expensive machinery and so on and so forth. Um, but all of that can be done by AI. And so things that right now, that used to be really expensive, like traveling to Australia, now that's a service, right? You take your phone out, you go tap, 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 and you're in Australia tomorrow and it's next, it's next cost next to nothing. And then they send you back because they have a COVID quarantine. But with AI, with general purpose AI, everything becomes like that. It's basically tap, tap, tap. And you know, within the limits of physics, uh, it becomes available to you. So if you forget the science fiction, right? The eternal life and the fast and light travel, warp drives, all the rest of it, right? And just use the AI to deliver quality of life that we already know how to deliver to a small fraction of the population uh, and just deliver that to everyone. So no new technology other than the AI. Um, that gives you about a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world. And so the, the cash equivalent, the net present value is $13.5 quadrillion. So a lot of money, right? Makes the billions and trillions absolutely negligible and, and sort of invisible in comparison. You could even have better things than that, right? You could have very high quality individualized education, uh, you know, equivalent to a whole army of personal tutors uh, for every child in the world. Um, you know, and we know from experiments that um, that can bring a child to the level of college entry um, by the age of 10. So you can do a lot uh, with this kind of technology. Um, and, but as Katya said, right, we will gradually start filling more and more of the current human economic roles. Uh, and that leads you to a, a not necessarily desirable consequence of success. Uh, you know, and Wall-E is a very subversive movie, uh, despite being a Disney movie. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, the ideas can be traced back, I think, to a story by E.M. Forster in 1909 called The Machine Stops, where uh, essentially the, the ability of AI systems to care for everyone results in this infantilization. Um, and uh, he predicted in 1909, obesity and iPads and internet and email and MOOCs uh, and uh, uh, unwillingness to have face-to-face -face meetings and a bunch of other stuff. It's a pretty amazing story. Um, so to summarize, then we have uh, a big risk, which is losing control, uh, increase it over increasing parts of our world. And I say I would say we've already lost control over very important parts of our world. Um, we will lose control over increasingly large parts of the world if we don't do this right. 
Um, and I think there is a technical uh, direction we could take that's that's better than the one we're doing. But if we go, if we if we succeed, right, then we face the problem that uh, we we actually have a choice about our future, right? Um, and when you look, when you look at the Star Trek world, or um, another very well imagined set of worlds is the uh, the culture novels by Ian Banks. Um, they face this real problem uh, of what on earth do you do all day, all right? And, and you can see this in Star Trek where people really want to be in Starfleet and they solve the problem of what you do all day by this sort of expansionism. Uh, some might call it imperialism. I don't think Captain Picard would call it imperialism, but certainly expansionism, right? So you're on that expanding cutting edge and everyone wants to get into Starfleet because if you're not in Starfleet, there's nothing much to do. Uh, and the same in, in the culture novels, everyone wants to get into what's called contact because uh, if you're not, there's nothing much to do. Right? You have a high standard of living, but no real purpose in life. Um, and so um, the World Economic Forum and the XPRIZE Foundation are actually running a short film competition uh, to find a, a sort of morally worthwhile mode of coexistence between human beings and super intelligent machines right? after uh, AI can do all the things that we currently call work. Um, so this, this uh, for me, this is like the, uh, Alexa's suggestion that uh, that this would be the focus of the meeting was was excellent. Um, that uh, we should we really need to strain our imaginations to work through this because I I am not aware of good examples of a future that we might actually aim for. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much. That was uh, wonderful. And uh, great uh, food for thought. We have already a few questions, but I wanted to say, so um, two things come to my mind with all of, after hearing all of this. So how do we do this? Go on the right path because the, wrong path is mostly because of capitalism, right? So everybody who develops some AI um, wants to make money from, for their company and uh, would do what's the right way to embark now. Do we put regulations in place? I feel like I work on regulation, so maybe I should speak to that, um, some part of it, but I, Stuart, I saw you also wanted to speak. Go ahead, go ahead. So uh, certainly um, capitalism is uh, a hugely dynamic role here, but also are many are other types of systems of power um, at play when we're talking about these scenarios and these technologies. I think one of the things we wanna remember is that um, many of the kinds of AI and tech companies now are kind of narrated or have been narrated for the past 30 years quite powerfully as, um, you know, liberatory. Um, and yet what we know, and we know this because of the people who have studied those who have been most harmed um, or most vulnerable to these technologies, um, the experimentation, like in many industries, happens on the most vulnerable around the world. So when I think of Professor Russell's, um, you know, movie about autonomous weapons um, killing people, we know those don't get experimented and deployed in Beverly Hills. They get experimented and deployed in the global south. So, um, and that can go for predictive policing, that can go for all kinds of different uh, harmful technologies. So part of it is about who is the extractive disposable market by which these technologies are deployed for profit. Part of it is also that, you know, in the US context, certainly um, most of the tech sector doesn't pay taxes. 
Um, they're huge corporate tax evaders. They offshore their profits. So you have, and, and I can tell you this as a, a professor at UCLA and a, an incredibly under-resourced um, university, uh, a public school, public university. I know Berkeley is going through the same things right now. Um, all of our kind of public universities in California, how could we be um, resource um, uh, you know, struggling with austerity measures when we have Silicon Valley. You would think that in terms of the model of capitalism that that the largesse of the um, profits, um, the largesse of the benefit, and I think that, um, you know, we're talking here about the personal benefits of AI, but also what happens when these industries are so expansive and they are printing trillions of dollars, um, those resources don't go back into larger publics, the very publics that provide the, um, you know, the space for extraction and profitability. So I think these are some of the kinds of challenges that we need to nuance in our narration about what big tech companies are doing. Um, part of it is the technical specific way. And I think that, you know, I'm so appreciative of hearing this conversation with you. Um, Professor Russell and I are on a committee um, together in the UC and I, we've never had this conversation. So I'm so, so grateful that we get to have it tonight. But, you know, um, there's the technical dimensions and certainly we know that the way even in which AI is conceived of different parts of the world is different. Um, and to whose benefit is the question we wanna always be asking. Who, who wins, but also who loses? Um, I don't think that it's capitalism is precise enough. I think we wanna be much more specific and we wanna story tell um, because we can't talk about these things without talking about racial justice, without talking about gender equity, without talking about investment in the public good um, and divestment from the public good and the role that this sector is playing in relationship to those issues. Um, yeah, so that I, I, I don't disagree with all that, uh, but I would say in some ways it's worse. Um, the the reason why we lose control is, is to super intelligent AI is actually similar to the way we've lost control uh, in climate. Um, you know, we, we all, right, we all understand that there's a huge climate problem, we have to fix it, but we lost, right? The human race lost a conflict with a fossil fuel industry that planned for this for more than 50 years. Right? They began more than 50 years ago preparing for climate change in the sense of disinformation, political uh, regulatory capture, uh, and so on and so forth, so that they could continue doing what they're doing. Right? And we lost. And you could think of this, so you could think of corporations in that way as AI systems pursuing an incorrectly defined objective, uh, namely uh, a quarterly profit that doesn't take into account the externalities um, that they're producing. And I, I think this is actually a reasonably coherent narrative. Um, and, and some people argue that, you know, we don't need to speculate about whether super intelligent machines can take over the world. They already have. These machines, these corporate machines have human components but the human components are sort of, you know, they're algorithmic components in a machine, in a decision-making machine um, where they have a defined role. And they, in, in many cases, they also very quickly get co-opted uh, to those objectives. Um, and um, I would also say uh, that, you know, I think Alexis said the same, it, it isn't just, um, happening in the capitalist world, right? This mistake um, is happening in China, for example, where um, they're setting up a machinery. I think it's still only partial right now for maximizing social credit score. Um, and if they think, right, this is the classic uh, example 
of, uh, of what happens when you set up a metric, right? Um, sometimes called Goodhart's law, right? You end up trying to maximize the metric instead of the thing that the metric was trying to measure, right? So the social credit score is something about uh, people being pro-social um, and harmonious and, and well-ordered in their behavior and so on. What, you, what you'll end up with is a completely cynical society where no one goes to visit their parents unless they're sure that they're gonna get the social credit brownie points for doing so. Uh, and they may even simulate the visit and still get the points and so on and so forth, right? So um, uh, it, it's a kind of an engineering mentality that says, you know, oh, here's an objective that we can write down, so let's optimize it. Uh, and invariably it goes wrong. Uh, and the more, the more you sort of turn it over to, to a mechanical process that doesn't understand the wider context, the worse things get. So there comes in again, uh, our responsibility and power as storytellers. If we tell awesome stories for a better AI, better use of AI, uh, people will follow, right? That's, uh, I, I feel that seems to be the only way. I Although think, yeah. big, big tobacco, tobacco got regulated after a after long time of killed, um, four yeah after they four killed many people, people I think uh, something like that um, so uh, and they're still going right I mean in fact again, sure. tobacco deaths is still uh, up at a very high level um, okay but we do want to recognize that I think you know writers and Hollywood and certainly advertisers understood what the shift from valorizing smoking um, meant to the larger public. So, um, you know, I think as, as bleak as the things are that I study, which are the most degrading dimensions of internet technology, I think, you know, we want to remember that, um, and maybe this is my own like subjective like in my own identity. I mean, I'm a black woman and I come from a long history of African-American people in this country for whom, um, you know, the, the ability to even envision freedom from enslavement um, for multiple generations might have seemed absolutely impossible and implausible. And yet here we are we a small handful of abolitionists relative to the millions of people that were populating the United States were able to shift the cultural, political, and social narrative about the transatlantic slave trade and then the 200 year institution of slavery. So I think it's really important, and maybe this is again because of my own identity, I, I cannot believe that we would. Um, no matter how difficult, absolve ourselves of the responsibility to work on these things. And this is one of the reasons why I appreciate this conversation so much. Yes, many different kinds of oppressive systems seem totalizing. Indeed, they can be for many decades or centuries. And yet we still have to have some um, possibility in the human spirit to narrate and articulate and envision and write into a different future. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is absolutely crucial that people are storytelling and culture shifting around these harmful technologies rather than what we see any given night on television, which is, you know, some type of um, uh, like futuristic imaginary, and this is Katya to, you know, your points, right, about, um, about a, a technological future that somehow only has white people in it um, or often only has and is um, uncritically examined or engaged with. And so I guess I just wanna drop that into this conversation to say, we have lost control of a lot of narratives and many of these technologies are so dangerous and um, you know, probably all of us on this call don't sleep much at night when we think about what's really at stake. But I also think that um, is such a tremendous opportunity for us to 
you know, right to quote, um, you know, Lynn manuel like, write our way out of this. And I do think that that's crucially important. And I think that's something that researchers are doing constantly and journalists who are um, working with us are doing that. And, you know, this partnership is really important um, for precisely these reasons that we have different imaginaries than tripling down on the status quo. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And, you know, to Sophia's point about the, like what do we valorize as culture and like especially addressing creative people and people who shape culture who shape the aspirations of you know future generations it's like there is a reason why professor russell's best students go to work where they go to work like this is you know when you meet someone and they tell you that they founded an ai startup you go cool you know good for you like we very much uh, valorize all that and, you know, celebrate those people and afford them a lot of prestige in society, right? So how do we begin um, distinguishing and asking questions like what kind of AI you're working on? Right? Like what does your AI do? Is it the kind of AI that is assistive and is meant to help humans, the kind of AI that Professor Russell was describing? Or is it, or are you just you know, building tools to squeeze workers, you know, cut labor costs, you know, uh, surveil people at work and, you know, squeeze the last bits of productivity um, from them. Because these are very different kinds of applications, but we uh, just like see that, you know, technology industry um, kind of bundling it all together and, and looking up to all of that. And of course, you know, regulation is, incredibly important, but, you know, these narratives and these aspirations, they go hand in hand. And, and you know, regulation comes when there is a popular support for that and popular demand. So, like, it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg, you know, problem here. And um, definitely beginning to recognize the externalities that we right now are allowing the technology industry to get away with, you know, you just get to be an innovator who just, uh, you know, creates new things that, do, you know, potentially destroy jobs in society and society just like gets to uh, um, receive all of those costs and compensate for those. So that that is now on communities, um, you know, of those workers to find new jobs, to re-educate people. It's, it is on taxpayers to provide UBI or expanded social safety net, you know, improved education. It is not on the innovator who just like, gets to walk away as a, as a cool person there, right? So these are stories and narratives and perceptions that can be reshaped and need to be reshaped. Cool, and here's a question that ties right into this. What one thing would you love to see in family movies, meaning young and old audiences watching together that feature an AI, an AI character like Wally or, or just AI uh, in general? Um, what's one thing you wish you, or oh, what's uh, one thing you wish you would stop seeing, but I think more interesting is what would you love to see for a family movie? And this uh, goes to all of you. Who wants to go first? Stuart looks like he has something in mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I I think actually the, the AI characters in those movies are, um, Right, they're extremely sympathetic, and um, even though Wally is doesn't look like a human, right? Uh, because it has two cameras, uh, that's enough um, to um, to make you understand uh, his his mental state or her mental state. I don't. I, don't, I, I guess it's a he. Um, then, um, you know, the, but the greater degrees of anthropomorphization, I think, are uh, highly undesirable, right? I think the Great. idea that the perfection of a robot is one that looks exactly like a human uh, is really a bad idea. Um, 
because it, you know, it, it's in movies and TV right now, um, but it'll be in reality if we, uh, if we don't get away from that imaginary, right? And, and it would be, I mean, imagine a child growing up and, and not understanding really the difference between the robot and the human because they look identical and they have you know, beautifully modulated voices and so on and so forth. But the human cares for the child and the robot doesn't, right? The robot may appear to care. Um, you know, I think what one of the greatest scenes in all the AI movies is in her where, um, where Joaquin Phoenix, I guess, asks uh, Scarlett Johansson, you know, are you, uh, are you seeing anybody else? And she says, uh, yes, I am currently in an equivalently intense relationship with 6,779 other human beings, right? And that's the end of his world, right? And, uh, and then you sort of, you know, the curtain is, is lifted from his eyes. Um, we have to keep this distinction between what machines are and what humans are. And I think that's really important. Yeah, I would, I couldn't underscore that enough. And this is where I think of the work of Dr. Miriam Sweeney at the University of Alabama, you know, um, ever for every one of these kinds of questions, I can think of like three scholars pop into my mind who spent a decade or more thinking about these very issues of like concern over anthropomorphication of, of AI or of robots or of the way in which robots, for example, are given white skin and blue light eyes and, you know, like the subtle other ways in which um, the mapping of racial and gender stereotypes onto um, AI and technology also happens that also has consequence um, that, you know, the humanists, we care about these kinds of things. Um, we understand how media stereotyping works. And, and, you know, so one of the challenges, of course, is the way in which um, desirable characters and undesirable characters. I always feel sensitive to like na naming, um, Stuart, you're so good at naming these films. I'm afraid that that like some writer is going to um, be in the room on something that I might name is a problem. So I'm just going to say that um, that is absolutely important. I think another dimension is um, putting these technologies in the here and now in ways that are um, have consequence like making more visible the consequences in the today, um, because so many of these get put into, again, like some type of future, um, imagined future, and, you know, with, with all the kind of laden and attendant problems that can come with that. So how do we put these in the context of today and um, human choices that can be made about the embrace, right, or the consequence. Um, I think so many of the narratives around AI, um, in, especially in family films, are definitely, uh, I mean, I'll tell you, because I've got a 10-year-old um, who, can you imagine what it's like me being his mom, where I'm like, mm -mm, nope. And he's like, why can't you just be a regular parent who lets me have Alexa, you know, and I'm like, not doing it. So helping and showing kind of what's at stake as parents relinquish control to machines for kids and what's lost, what's gained. Um, it's kind of really, I think, setting up and prioritizing our humanity and our human relations and human connections, because I think those are um, extremely valuable. We have so much more mediation of human connection than ever. And um, of course, that is like a typically like a huge layer of social media or some other type of, um, you know, profit layer between us and other people. So ways to, I think, um, problematize that could be really valuable. Adding to this really great wish list, a couple of things. I think we really, like, I would love more stories that portray artificial intelligence and robots as helpers. Uh, to humans as opposed to, you know, entities that are way more superior and that have like much greater intelligence, which doesn't acknowledge the role of the humans in creating that intelligence and kind of like the, the emergent, um, the intelligence that emerges from 
from different people and machines and really the, these diverse minds coming together that really like supersedes anything that, that can be done on an individual level. And also the people who uh, in, imbue machines with their intelligence, like that is just like completely neglected and doesn't really, um, doesn't really get any reflection in, in the, um, in the media portrayals of artificial intelligence. It just like seems completely artificial and so much greater and so much more perfect than, than human intelligence while it is really a derivative of uh, you know, human creation. So I would love to like show the, the role of you know, people who label data and teach machines um, to, to, to do what they're able to do right now uh, more prominently. I think I want to slightly object uh, in some ways. I think um, I mean there, we are going through a phase where a lot of uh, machine learning systems are trained from human labeled data, but I actually think that's just a phase. Um, and we'll, you know, I think we're already seeing systems that do just as well with no labels at all. So the, you know, it's, it's really a consequence of mathematics that the system is intelligent. Yeah, but we don't admit to like having that face, right? And, and the role that these humans and their intelligence have played so far, at least not in the, um, in the screen portrayals. That's, I think that's true. Um, but the, and, and I think you're right that at the moment, AI systems are only equipped to be helpers because they are vastly inferior to human beings, um, except in these very, very narrow, uh, almost sort of mathematically defined areas like chess and Go. Um, but they're not even particularly good at recognizing objects in, in photographs, for example. Um, but eventually, right, so the, there's, there seems to be this inevitable coupling of superiority and power, right? If the AI system is superior, then it's going to be in a position of power over humans. Um, and that's what we have to get away from because we're going to have superior uh, AI, but it has to remain in a position where humans have the power forever. And, and there isn't a good metaphor in ordinary life for this, right? I mean, because uh, for example, um, for humans to have a sort of healthy, vigorous civilization, you know, you have to avoid the, the wall-e scenario where all the humans are pampered and infantilized. So that means that the AI systems have to stand back and you know, effectively tell the humans, no, today you have to tie your own shoelaces, right? As a, any of you who are parents, you know, that, that's a big transition uh, when your child has to tie their own shoelaces before they go to school. Um, but that metaphor would say, okay, the AI is the parent and the human is the child. That's not the right metaphor because we still want the humans to be the ones who are in control. Uh, and you just can't find a good metaphor where the superior entity uh, is the one that's controlled um, by a, uh, an inferior entity, but that's the metaphor that we need. Um, so we have to sort of come up with stories uh, completely from scratch. I mean, I think of a metaphor that I think about in my own work, which is, uh, you know, systems of, of power, like, you know, patriarchy or racism, where we also live, we coexist under those systems, but there's also still a strong um, impulse to resist and to push back, even though the systems are made in service of um, certain people. Um, in the United States, it's, you know, white people and, um, or it's men. And, you know, one of the things I think, Katya, that, you know, resonates for me about what you're saying is that we don't name the super intelligence as reflecting the values of those people either. The very, very narrow band of people who get to be the makers of these kinds of technologies. We really don't in on the big screen. I mean, there are certainly feminist scholars, those of us who are trying to make visible 
um, you know, we talk about this now, like the common way that people talk about it is like biased AI, but that's really a defanging and a depoliticizing of a lot of our early work that was naming what those biases were. Those were biases of a discrete class of people in our society who get to imbue the technologies with their values and, um, and their logics. And maybe we're splitting hairs here, but I think that 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 type of visibility is extremely important because it does give us then space to imagine what it might be like to have a world where those logics don't dominate, right? Where we have a multiracial democracy, where we have gender equity, where we don't have structural racism. Um, There are, I think, metaphors in the world and systems of power in the world that, um, that we can draw from to say, we don't want to be controlled in these particular ways, or we want equity or freedom from these kinds of systems. And for me, those are the metaphors that I draw down from for thinking about what it might be like to also be controlled by AI, which is really, to me, a more of a masking and an opacity of the kinds of um, power systems we already live under. So, you know, because the kinds of t- technologies we're talking about, maybe this is because I work on more uh, basic deployments that everyday people are engaging with, they are the kinds of narrow AI that overdetermine um, whether people have an opportunity to have agency in their lives or not, um, whether they will go to prison for the rest of their lives for a minor offense, whether they will get into college, whether they will get a mortgage, I mean, these kinds of systems. And I think now is the time to apprehend and make visible the very basic, because when we get into like superhuman, um, super intelligent machines, these kinds of ideas, I think people think of that being 500 years from now, while they forego caring for and resisting these everyday systems that are Um, increasing global inequality, increasing social inequality, economic inequality, and are implicated in that. And I guess that's all I'm trying to get at is that we need, we need a lot of stories about that right now. Uh, Yeah, interesting, totally get it. That was also one reason why I wanted to bring you on and what has been uh, very interesting to me, this idea that the tech people alone can't do it and the, the humanities and the tech people have to figure it out together. And of course, since AI is, can only be as good as we humans are, it's about the people who work on it, program it, uh, think about it, think about the goals uh, that need to be diverse and that have the power to to make changes. Um, in mo- movies often uh, also, I mean, uh, tell stories of scientists and we have had scientists at the Writers Guild before and we ask them, so what do you hate about or what, what is totally wrong in these movies that have a scientist hero at the, uh, um, and they were say, saying, oh, we, work in teams. There is no one hero that saves the world. It only works if we all work together, if there's like a pandemic or whatever. So that's uh, like one uh, thing that you writers get always wrong. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, And this- Well, another thing that writers get wrong is that the reason that we know about some of the most harmful effects of these technologies is that women quite frankly, journalists and scholars and activists have been on the front lines of doing the writing and research about it. And I have to say it because I think um, we're living through a moment right now where uh, former tech evangelists have somehow moved to the front of the line as the new tech reformers and are um, somehow in charge of the solutions that are the problems of their own making. And we're seeing that in some of the recent films that have come out. And I think that is a really big challenge where um, I can think of 20 years easily, 30 years 
of women scholars and journalists who've been on the case who've actually made these issues of like, you know, bias technology, um, for lack of a better phrase, um, visible. So I would just offer that too. Yeah, so it's really uh, about... Uh, portraying people who work on AI uh, in a different way also, not just like the cre creations, the robots that we see, but also the people who do work on it to create this, they, they could also be a yeah, very important focus. Um, which brings me, does anybody want to share anything about your everyday life, like your daily work day or jokes that you guys tell, tell tell each other that have to do with AI. And uh, Sophia already got a little bit into what motivated her to get into this field and what her journey was um, for Katya and, and Stuart. Do you want to share like a couple of interesting things that Ryder might need. Oh, I think uh, my, yeah, my entry into the field was probably quite traditional in a sense that, um, you know, I, I was exposed to computers um, through my school. Actually, it was really because I hated playing rugby. And um, we had compulsory rugby at my school and I was very small and young compared to all the other people. Um, and so I would do anything to get out of playing rugby. And then the, there was a nearby college that said, um, we're starting this new thing called a computing course. Uh, would you like to send some of the pupils to take this course? But of course it would be on the day when we have compulsory rugby. So I said, yes, I'm, I'm all for that. And as soon as I understood really what a computer was, I just wanted to make it intelligent. Um, you know, I, I wanted, uh, wrote a chess program and Uh, and so on. But this was before, you know, it was before there were any degree programs in computer science. So, you know, I, I thought, I, I always thought my real job would be that I would be a, you know, particle physicist. And, um, but then when I found out you could actually pursue AI uh, and do it in California, I thought, okay, that's, that's where I'm going. So, and I've been doing that. Um, so yeah, 30, been at Berkeley 35 years. Um, and I would say, you know, interestingly, the, the first edition of my textbook, which I wrote in 1994, has a whole section titled, What If We Succeed? So I was thinking about this question back then, uh, you know, when we all get to Mars, what are we going to breathe? Um, and, uh, but I, I It was only in the last five years or so that I've actually understood, you know, really been able to diagnose the problem and figure out another way, um, another way to do AI. And um, as for AI humor, I actually, before we started this, uh, this meeting, I went online and said, looked up best AI jokes. Uh, and, um, And they're really, I have to say, they were all absolutely terrible. So uh, I'm not, they, I wouldn't even repeat some. Um, but there are things that make you laugh in AI when, when we try to get AI systems to write poetry or, um, or to write stories. Uh, and they're just unintentionally funny because it was actually, I think it's pretty interesting for a professional writer to look at those stories and see why they fail. Um, you know, and, and because until you see a failed story like this, I think you don't understand how much goes into making a successful story, right? How all, right, all the loose ends have to tie up in exactly the right way and things that are introduced have to be used. Uh, you know, the AI, don't un the AI doesn't understand this, so it just sort of introduces spurious details and then does nothing with it or it, it you know this this one like you know the, there was a clever crow and a greedy fox and the clever crow had a piece of cheese in its mouth and the fox walked over to the tree and the crow ate the cheese the end 
right? It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why did you tell me all the stuff, but, but nothing at, you know, there were, you, you forgot the, you know, the crux. Um, and that comes actually, so in, in one of the questions in the chat, which I think was actually ended up being visible to the panelists only from Rebecca, um, was pointing out that, you know, as where I was asking earlier, can someone please describe uh, a really morally valuable coexistence between humans and superintelligent AI? And Rebecca points out, well, that's difficult because that means stasis and stories, films, TV, movies, right? They require conflict uh, for there to be a plot. Um, and I think, I think that is an interesting obstacle, but let's at least start from, start from the imagination part uh, and then we can bring in conflict and plot within that world. But, um, you know, the, as you know, the vast majority of uh, future science fiction about powerful AI is, is dystopian. Um, and, you know, and, and in many, um, in many cases, really, it is the end of the human race. So yeah, the, uh, very nicely put. And story. oops, sorry. Are okay. you? No, very nicely uh, said. Because I think that's often an excuse that it says, "Oh, but we need conflict," and uh, there, there's conflict. I mean, in movies with high conflict, there's always somebody fighting for a cause. Uh, or against the villain and, and that there we have our conflict. It's just the way how we wrap it together, right. I would say. Yeah, so AI doesn't have to be the villain. There can be other humans. Yeah, 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 exactly. AI can be you know, a medium for the conflict, uh, can be a tool in the conflict. It can be subverted um, by the human and so on and so forth. Um, so there's, there's lots of plots, I think. Yeah, and one question here, uh, as a couple of questions were um, asking about what if uh, it falls in AI's powerful AI systems fall in the hands of terrorists, or how can cybersecurity be um, uh, secured that some hackers don't use it for bad purposes uh, and. All of those, I think, are great plots for, for movies with lots of uh, conflict. What do you think? Last minutes. Agree? Yeah, I mean, the, the, these are the two questions that I don't know how to answer, right? I, I've tried to figure out how, to, okay, how do we not lose control to AI, but people who want to misuse the AI, they're not going to use the beneficial AI they're going to try to use the AI to take over the world and they'll probably fail um, because the AI will end up destroying them as well. Um, and then the other one is this overuse scenario, the infantilization of, of the human race, um, which in many ways is the biggest possible tragedy that could occur, right? I mean, I think you, if you think back to all the generations, right, going back uh, hundreds of thousands of years of human history, it's, it turns out to be a trillion years of learning that we have put into keeping our civilization going because we have no choice, right? The humans are the only ones who can run our civilization for us. But as soon as that stops being true, right? If the machines can run our civilization for us, then the incentive for us to learn and put in all those, uh, all those billions of person years more of learning, uh, that incentive goes away. So one, and this is the cultural problem, right? And this is where you guys come in, right? Is create a culture where learning is, is intrinsically valued, not just because it makes you a useful member of society, not just because you get higher pay if you, uh, if you can fulfill more of these functions, but that is just an important part of being a human being. Um, and uh, and you know, even a, an attractive, uh, and valued human being is, is uh, you know, um, that's a really important incentive as well. Yeah, uh, 
Anybody wants to add something to this nice closing <laughs> statement? <laughs> uh, maybe this is like less settling. I just want to like put in a caution around the bad actors and like the terrorists using AI in on, on big screen, because like this is often used as an excuse then for the like the actors who claim to be good to be saying, well, we still want to be developing you know, autonomous weapons because the bad actors might develop that, right? So we don't want, we don't want those cop-outs to, to be you know, legitimized uh, more than they already are. Um, but, you know, but still like big plus one that AI does not have to be the, the enemy. And you know, the more we can portray collaboration and cooperation, um, I think the better. Yeah, nicely said. Um, no, I think AI must be in the hands of the good people and the bad people have other agendas and fight with other, well, that's me already going off with my fantasy. Anyhow, uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, taking the time to be with us. Um, it was amazing. I loved it. You're wonderful and thank you for your generous uh, insight into the topic. And yeah, I, I'm, unfortunately we have to end it here and I wish you all a very beautiful weekend.